So this panel is uh, called What Party Has Greater Challenges Ahead? And we're going to look at um, some of the themes I think that we touched on in the first panel um, and then certainly in the second panel about the divisions within both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party and how things um, are splitting, changing, morphing potentially into third parties. Um, and I, I, I'm going to do a quick disclaimer um, and say that um, we have actually three Republicans on, our, on, our, on this panel and one Democrat, and I'm the nonpartisan journalist moderator. Um, so instead of making poor Doug defend the entire Democratic Party all the time, um, I think what we're just going to do is much more of an open family style kind of conversation where Doug can weigh in on Republicans and Republicans can weigh in on Democrats and we can all talk, look at this uh, issue together, these issues. Um, but I am going to start on the Republican side, since they are the party in power. And I'm going to tell just a little bit of a story um, from, from my experience, and, and then I'm going to open it up to, um, to the, the folks in the panel for their thoughts on this. I remember being you know, with Time Magazine in 2013 covering the Oklahoma tor uh, tornadoes in Moore, Oklahoma, that had destroyed the, the town. And, um, and we were standing in the worst street that was hit, and the entire political delegation from Oklahoma came, and um, it was Mary Fallon, who was governor, and then the senior senator, James Inhofe, who's a Republican, the junior senator, who at that point was Dr. Tom Coburn, who was also a Republican, who was about to step down because he had cancer and he was retiring early. Um, and then James Lankford, who is uh, one of the members of Congress, who was running for Dr. Coburn's seat. And, um, and the, there was a local journalist who asked the, you know, the, the assembled politicos, so this was terrible, what are you going to do to address these tornadoes that in Oklahoma that every 10 years kind of destroys our, um, you know, whole, whole, set, whole towns in our state. And Inhofe said, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm a member of the Appropriations Committee. I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to see if I can get money from the federal government to see that if we can put a safe room in every school in Oklahoma so that we parents can know that their children have a place right there where they can be saved if there's a tornado and p people in the community will know that there's, you know, a place where they can go in just in case their tornado alarm goes off. And um, the reporter then turned to Dr. Coburn who said, <laughs> Would you support that move? And Dr. Coburn, very amazingly, considering he was surrounded by all these families who just lost everything, said, "No, I do not support giving any federal money for this because, um, you know, that's I'm a, so I'm a fiscal conservative, and this is the job of the state to do that. And so it's Governor Fallon's job. And Governor Fallon was sort of staring daggers at him at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and." And then the reporter turned to Lankford, who was running for Coburn's seat, and said, well, what do you think about Dr. Coburn's comments? Would you support putting in safe rooms in schools? And Lankford said, not only would I support Dr. Coburn in this, and there should not be any federal funding for schools, I don't think I would give federal funding for FEMA to help recover this. <laughs> and, um, and poor Inhofe, who'd started us, this whole thing off, was left gaping and sort of trying to defend himself as a Republican. He was like, you know, trying to say, look, I'm not a moderate. I'm an actual fiscal conservative Republican. I just believe that, you know, but it's amazing to me that someone like James Inhofe can now be concerned basically considered a moderate in, in the Oklahoma dele delegation. This man is one of the most conservative members of Congress. And it really showed, it illustrated to me the migration of the Republican Party in recent years and how far to the right it swung. And so I'd like to just start with those thoughts, but get your thoughts on, mm. on the swing of the Republican Party and, and can it remain a whole party or might it go the way of the Whigs? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, thanks for having the door open. It reminds us what a lovely day we have. Um, <laughs> Um, see, this is how tricky the Main Street media is. <laughs> see the question? See how she framed up that question? <laughs> now, I could say seven or eight Democrats potentially running for president, signing on to single payer Bernie Sanders bill. I have a question about that coming down um, the <laughs> would, show, would show actually a broader question, which is have the parties both moved um, in a certain direction and have the polarization um, and which maybe is creating this dystopia with Washington that the parties in order to get to Washington have to go so far to the edges that, you know, it used to be 8% of the voters made up the election and they were the independents and people who, who kind of sit in the middle. So you'd spend, you know, a year and a half of your campaign talking to the people who were going to vote for you anyway, probably. And then you spent the last three months trying to get those last 8% to break, you know, 50.1 your way and win. Um, and now, you know, you see both parties kind of really moving into their wings. Um, 
so um, yeah, the question is, what, you know, what does it mean? I mean, um, Eric Cantor was a conservative until he wasn't, and he lost. And um, you know, and I don't, I'm not familiar with, the, I don't study the Democrats as much as so, but I'm sure they're Democrat. Maybe Feinstein, who is California super liberal of my entire adult career, and all of a sudden she's getting the primary. Um, so you kind of look at it and say, like, what does it all mean? Like, where's all this headed? Um, it's tough to see. I mean, it's tough. To, it's tough to predict. And and I, you know, in in, in from the Republican perspective, um, six, eight, ten, and twelve, we had this Tea Party movement come out, and it took us about six years to kind of get our arms around it and understand it. And I think we largely do. You know, then Trump comes along and he kind of scrambles the whole pie again, and we have to now try and figure out what it means to be. There was Republican, then there was conservative Republican in my lifetime, and then it was Tea Party Republican, and now it's Trump Republican. So it's always kind of like, you know, someone earlier said, do you fear the Republican Party breaking into two? And I was like, oh, if it only be two, that'd be awesome. We could really, <laughs> we could really do some stuff. Um, so I'll stop there. Thanks, Rob. I, I, uh, <laughs> where, where do I start? So I'll start back in 1992, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a story. Uh, George H.W. Bush had just lost the presidential election, and we were rounding the corner into 1993, and my boss, then Congressman John Kasich, said, well, we're going to have a reception for the people who are coming for President Clinton's inauguration. I said, Johnny, you out of your mind? These guys are Democrats. Clinton won. And he said, you need to understand, Ron, I represent 600, 700,000 people. I don't represent party. And if these people are coming to Washington and they want to see the new president, then we have to be there here as the representative of the 12th Congressional District of Ohio. And we had all sorts of folks, people of color, you name it, everybody crawling over his desk, wanting a picture. And I say that story to illustrate to you that John Kasich never lost anywhere under 60% of the vote. And he had Democrats who voted for him. He had a 40% of the black vote in Ohio voting for him. And they voted for him as a person and they didn't vote for him as a party. And Picking up on Rob's point, it seems to me that Democrats in the United States Congress vote for the party now and they don't vote for the position. And the Democrat party as a result, I think in the last 12 years has become a party that is bi-coastal. You can go all the way from Massachusetts, Maine, Massachusetts, all the way down to the DC beltway. And that's where a bulk of the Democrats are on the East Coast. You go in California, you start at Washington State, and you come down all the way to Los Angeles, a little bit south. That's where the Democrats are. But the Democrats aren't in the middle of the country foremost, uh, first and foremost anymore. And if you are pro-life, you're not a Democrat. If you aren't progressive, you're not a Democrat. If you're not in favor of some single payer, you're not a Democrat. So I don't worry so much about us as a party, as Republicans, that we've changed and we've lost our ways. I just think the polarization that we've seen from those folks on the other side of the aisle who don't want to work with us, don't want to talk with us, uh, has become much more polarized. And I'll, I'll say one last thing. Uh, a member of Congress, well, I'll, I'll dime him out. Uh, Dan Donovan, the only Republican who represents New York City on Staten Island, said, the only time during my day that I talk to a Democrat is when we do one minutes when the House opens in session because the Democrats don't want to be seen talking to a Republican. Democrats don't want to be seen talking to a Republican. So the polarization that the demonization of Republicans as being the evil ones and they're, they're trying to do this and that, I, I think it goes both ways, but I certainly see it from the other side of Democrats not wanting to talk to people like me and Rob and Elise. I'll talk to you guys. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Ted. There's always one. <laughs> There's one of us. In, um, so I, I would just, I mean, I think we started talking about sort of maybe the Republicans first, and I, I'll throw out some thoughts on that, and, and, and as well as the Democrats. I mean, I, I think that, um, I think the challenges that the Republican Party has uh, today are the same ones that they had in 2012 when they did their big um, post-mortem, uh, and that is they need to figure out how to expand it so that there are more people that look like me and Ron in the party, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, um, uh, his, uh, Hispanic voters and other people of color, because this country is changing. The demographics of the country are changing, and the party, in order to, um, you know, I think, um, uh, be a, a strong national party in ten years from now, is going to have to expand, uh, expand, uh, expand 
who's in it. And, um, you know, that didn't uh, ultimately hurt them in 2016, but uh, I think 2016 was a very unique election. Uh, so I would say that I think that is a, that's a, uh, that's a challenge that still exists. And I think there are issues that Republicans actually could probably use um, to their advantage to attract uh, people of color. Uh, and, um, um, but I think in order for that to happen, they need to, there, there needs to be a, t they, 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 those, there needs to be an effort by the party to, um, tear down a lot of the, um, I think sort of hostile rhetoric that we're seeing from the white house, not necessarily from people in Congress right now. Uh, so I'm not putting this on McConnell and. Ryan, I have my disagreements with them on policy, but I do think that you know when you when when you when you're seeing the president of the United States, who is a Republican, who is a st Republican standard bearer, um, say the things that he has said about um, many different groups in the United States. I think that makes it really hard for the party to sell uh, things like um, school choice or um, tax reform or other things that might be. Um, uh, attractive to uh, uh, people of color in the United States. Uh, they, they just won't even open the door to have that conversation with the Republicans because of what they're seeing m mostly from the White House in terms of how, uh, he ha how the president has uh, demonized um, many different groups. And so, um, you know, and in our end, uh, you know, I think on the, I think the Democrats just, you know, there are two two issues that I think that they need to get a, do a better job of. They need to, um, they need to instead of look at uh, their base voters, their African American and uh, Hispanic voters as uh, strictly turnout. They need to look at them as persuasion voters. Uh, typically, the way we run our campaigns is we don't, you know, at the you know, they aren't communicating. Um, um, not they they don't really begin significant paid communication efforts to their base until much later, uh, and then it's a turnout communication. It's not a persuasion communication. And the difference is is that when we when we try to when we when we use persuasion communication with swing voters, that starts much earlier, and there's a much bigger investment in, into that communication. Um, and I think this is you know I think that the party can't. They have to understand that people are making decision in their base between, and we saw this in 2016, not so much between voting for the Republican or the Democrat, uh, not, not so much uh, uh, voting for the Republican, but just not voting. And so what's worse? You know, I mean, I, I actually think that you have to, you have to, pers you have to begin a persuasion communication effort and organi organizing effort with your base voters much earlier than we have in the past. And then we've got to figure out how we get seniors back. And I think that there are, there's a, a number of things in the, the Republican uh, efforts to repeal ACA that will help Democrats with that in 2018. And then lastly, you know, they, they just, Democrats have sort of forgotten how to talk to people in the middle of the country. You know, it doesn't necessarily need to be, it's, in some ways it's not just a policy Effort like I think there are some policy, many policies that the, the Secretary Clinton and Democrats had that would that should be attractive to blue collar voters. But there's also just like um, uh, just an ability to connect and um, understand that there are certain you know there are just like with African American voters or Hispanic voters or certain th you know there are certain um, uh, cultural aspects and views that um, that are important. To these voters, and if you uh, disrespect those views or step on those views, whether it has to do with the Second Amendment or religion or you know um, what have you, that that's going to close the door to them. So you can't even get just like the door is closed to my to people of color to Republicans to talk to them about um, you know um, uh, school choice issues or charter schools or something like that. Democrats, I think, in some ways, have done the same with these voters in the middle of the country. So that when, uh, so that we can't even talk to them about our views on, you know, whether it's raising the minimum wage or trade issues or overall economic issues. So that's something that they've got to, that Democrats have to do a much better job of. I would like to take a step back and just think about 2016 and the primary process for a moment, just because I think that the two insurgent candidates who emerged 
what they were talking about and what they represented and what those policies were have actually a lot more in common than other people who are on the Democratic and the Republican debate stage. You consider that Bernie and Trump were railing constantly against career politicians, against uh, corporate lobbyists, corporatism. They were taking on the system. They were seen as the outliers. And then what their actual message was, both candidates were anti-free trade and were saying, we must you know, either get rid, get rid of these trade deals completely or we, uh, you know, or we walk out of now. You know, they both were in a huge, in a way that in a Republican primary, you couldn't have imagined that, that, that free trade would have surfaced as an issue. And consider that, you know, that both of those candidates were advocating a milder, a more restrained foreign policy. Granted, Donald Trump also said he would torture and kill women and children at the same time, but his overall message was for a more restrained foreign policy. You look at uh, immigration and the way Trump talked about immigration, Bernie Sanders translated that into how he was speaking about the working class and new jobs and revitalizing uh, America for the less fortunate. So I just think that a lot of the issues that, the, that those two candidates really uh, took to heart and it really resonated, taking on free trade, the, that the bailouts uh, were wrong and you know why are we in Wall Street's pocket. I think that we haven't really thought enough about what are these policies that the far right and the far left really managed to connect with voter zone. And I think it's something that the traditional party structure doesn't want to have to reckon with because of their donor base, hence exactly what they were successfully railing on as they rose to power. And you look at you know the most recent attempt to repeal and replace Obamacare, and that was so that was very donor driven because donors, a lot of big donors, wanted to see it done. When you look at Republican voters, and you know, a recent poll shows that one third of them support single payer, which is kind of a far step from repeal and replace. But have our voters shifted that much? Where Bernie Sanders, you know, proposing to just implode the national debt is an attractive option to a third of Republican voters. That's just what I would posit as we should be paying a little bit more attention to what are the ideas that are really gaining traction with what we call the fringe, but might actually be more widespread within the country as a whole. Well, I want to um, go back to that point, but also to one of the points that Rob made about, about factionalism. Um, and there was this, I think the, the idea and classic idea of politics is that there's big tent, you know, the, the parties expand and then you, you get so big that there's a lot of strife within the parties and then they, they, people feel like you're not representing the base and then it shrinks again to a smaller tent and you saw that certainly there have been, you know, the Barry Goldwater cycle on the Republican side, the George McGovern cycle on the Democratic side where they picked somebody they loved but who like lost every state um, and then like, you know, um, and then they would expand back out again and so Barry Goldwater laid the, the way for Ronald Reagan in a bigger tent, and George McGovern laid the way for, for, for Bill Clinton in a bigger tent. But I guess I want to ask the question is, is, is the two-party system dying in America because things are so factionalized and you see so many different parts of the parties at each other's throats and so you have like the fiscal, the three legs of the, of the Reagan stool and all three legs, the fiscal conservative, defense conservatives and social conservatives kind of all at each other's throats in many ways and arguing over what's the right way to go. You know, can we, can we come together still as parties is my question. Anyone want to? Internally, you mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think two things have occurred since 16, which I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's too early to tell. Um, one thing I would say is, did the Midwest realign fundamentally at the national level? Um, is the Rust Belt, which was pretty solidly for Democrats, is that is that going to follow Ohio's lead and really move to I mean, Missouri's lead and kind of move into the Republican column? Or was Trump, you know, kind of a... a generational type candidate who was able to, to move that electorate in a way that no other Republican will be able to. We just don't know. But the other thing <clears throat> is you've seen kind of 
you know, the rise of, you know, at this point, I'm not sure if Doug would agree, but it would appear that Bernie Sanders has a leadership role, if not is the leader of the Democratic Party right now. And I don't think he is registered Democrat right now. He wasn't until he, six weeks before he ran for president of the party, he registered. We have the same problem with Trump. So I'm, I'm not trying to throw stones on that point. But my point is, is so we've had a, and the Republican side, we've had a very messy fight with our far right that has gone back from 06. The rise of the Tea Party movement, you've seen us fight with them race after race, spend hundreds of millions of dollars fighting it out over who's right. Um, and you haven't seen that fight in 16, and maybe we're seeing seeds of it in California and some other primaries, but you really haven't seen it where instead of the Democrat establishment looking at Sanders and some of his ideas and saying, you're a self-proclaimed socialist and that's not gonna work in a general election and a national election. Instead, you've seen them kind of adopt it. So you've seen two, two different strategies. One is, you know, we, we, we have, like I said, spent hundreds of millions of dollars and, and lost races and won races trying to fight us an ideology that we think that the establishment, I'm, saying, I'm not, we is not the right word, but the, the party establishment is, considers a threat. Where in the Democratic side, you've seen them kind of lock, stock, and barrel to a large extent. Their top people who are the, the most prime candidates to run nationally kind of grab the far left ideas and say, I'm for it. And I don't know if that's a good development or a bad development. It's sure going to be a cheaper alternative in the long run because you don't have to have these expensive, painful primaries, I don't think. But will it, for, will it move the party too far to the left? Um, I don't know. I mean, that, that's, so the question on factionalism is, is you know, are we too fractious? Um, I think I think what you said about the Gutenberg Press, I got really that was really interesting. That maybe we are in a time <laughs> that we just haven't been able to process all the disruption, and it's reverberating in ways that someone in their seventies and someone in their twenties, like they're they're processing information in such different ways that it's hard for people to even understand. I mean, the, the Republican Party has always been factionalized. I mean, are we you know on foreign policy alone on um, uh, on the gold standard, we fought a hundred years as a party over this issue. In World War II, we thought killed it, killed the isolationists, and now they're they're, they're back again. I mean, so uh, it sounds like I'm putting my thumb on the scale who I think's right. But my point is, like we, I mean, I've always felt as a party, you know, we've always had trouble kind of having a coherent national brand. And certain key leaders like a Reagan have been able to carve it together and hold it together. But that's all it ever is: is that we just kind of hold it together and then it kind of falls apart. I guess my question, and I'll, I'll send, give this to both Ron and, and to Elise, or, and Doug if you want to weigh in, is, is, is the question of, since 2010, and even before that, the Republican Party has increasingly been going for purity standards. There's been rhinos, people have like increasingly said you're not a real Republican, and yet somehow they've managed to, through this, expand their majorities. How is that possible? <laughs> like, well, I think Republicans at the state level, what you really need to look at as we have this broader conversation is where we are as a party at the state level. I mean, if you look at the Republican Party right now, the Democrats lost 1,000 seats in the Obama area, 1,000 seats at the local level, 1,000 seats, uh, seats at the state legislative level, and several governorships. I mean, Republicans now have 34 out of the 50 governor mansions in the United States. We control a majority of the state houses. That's really where the power is. And if you look at that as it relates to redistricting and how these congressional districts will be drawn in the days and the years to come, that gives Republicans a built-in advantage that recognize up until we came into power in 1995, the Democrats had gerrymandered the districts and Republicans were out of power in the House of Representatives for 40 years. I would never go back 500 years, Jay, to the Gutenberg press, but I would certainly go back uh, 105. And I'd go back to 105 and look at the race of 1912 and where you had uh, Taft running for re-election. You had Theodore Roosevelt running in the Bull Moose Party. And then, of course, you had Woodrow Wilson. You had Theodore Roosevelt draw more votes as an independent candidate than any candidate running for a major party nomination in American history. And he still lost. If he hadn't gotten uh, in the race, of course, then Taft would have been re-elected. And that reminds you of 1992, 
where of course Ross Perot gets in the race, uh, siphons off 19% of the vote, and George H.W. Bush loses. So Republicans would be wise, and I always tell my students this, to be a student of history, of looking at past performance for future indicia of behavior. If Republicans go down this road of everyone says we're fractured and how you know we're not coming together as a party, you can look at 1912 and you can look at uh, the race with um, uh, George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton is an indication of if we're fractured, we lose. Yeah, I think, so you asked the question, is the two-party system dead? Um, I don't think it's dead, but I do think that they're facing a lot of the same challenges that, say, the newspaper industry felt, uh, had dealt with, the major networks had to deal with 20, 15, 20 years ago, the cable companies are dealing with now. It's that there are forces out there that, that are trying to disrupt um, uh, the party system. And, you know, the parties are either going to adapt to that and survive or they won't. And I think that, you know, it's too early to tell. I agree with, you know, with what Rob said. It is too, too early to tell. But, you know, there is just, a, you know, the, the large institutions, whether it is government, media, um, corporations, the two parties, Congress, None, none of these institutions are popular right now with, with people. They're just not. And that has occurred over time. But, you know, it's incumbent upon the leaders of the party um, to figure out how to adjust with the times and, um, and be able to be a place where uh, you can have differing views but feel welcome and at home. Uh, so, you know, they're, you know, I think someone mentioned Uber earlier, you know, the idea that taxi cab companies were going to be, you know, faced with this sort of competition. I mean, no one saw Uber 20 years ago, right? They came out of nowhere. Cable companies didn't see a Roku uh, or, a, 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 you know, a Apple TV coming, coming, you know, 20 years ago. But, you know, but they're now having to deal with that. And I think that um, – the parties, you know, the parties are going to have to do the same, or there will be um, whether it's a third party or some type of splinter party that pops up and, you know, kind of to your point, brings together some of these folks in both parties who, you know, actually have very similar beliefs on um, how they want the country run. I think there's much more of a of an opening for a national third party candidate. Otherwise, I think like going down to state level races, just completely pointless probably to try to, I don't, I mean, that would just, it would just take such a cataclysmic force to come in and, you know, basically and make any progress. Looking at the national level, I do think that we're probably going to see more celebrity candidates who try to run for, run for office with name ID, name recognition. I just, Kanye. I think, I think that all bets are fundamentally off. All bets are fundamentally off when it comes to looking at politics in the pre-2016 lens. I think that too much has changed and also just the forces of the younger millennial generation, a generation that uh, you know views socialism overwhelmingly positively. I mean, that's quite a generational shift from, you know, the baby boomers and World War II generation that were petrified by what they saw during World War II. So the political parties, I think, have to adjust and sell their ideas in the marketplace of ideas and just stop being so beholden to big donors uh, and actually start generating some creative policy. You look at this last healthcare debate and just how, uh, you know, the Republicans had seven years and really hadn't come up with anything except helping to preserve the power of the insurance cartels. It, uh, you know, it's really depressing that that's the best that these two political parties are offering right now. I want to, I, I, I definitely want to put a pin in that idea, Elise, and come back to it because I want to, I want to talk about policy and the sort of death of legislating. But um, I want to first take on something else that you mentioned earlier, and that's the idea of a national candidate running as a third party. And, and to drill in a little bit more with Ron um, for the party, the sort of bipartisan ticket that you presented this morning of John Kasich and John Hickenlooper. Um, how, I mean, how feasible, I mean, is the country ready to actually vote into office a third party ticket? And, and, and how possibly, how much money would it take to get them registered in all these states? I mean, is it 
Is it actually structurally possible to do this at this point? I don't know, Jay, that's a very good question. And it's a good question because ballot access varies by state. And can you have in states that you have to register as a Republican, you have to vote in the Republican primary, what if you have a Democrat who's running as vice president? I don't know how feasible it is at this juncture, but I can certainly tell you that I think that the appetite is out there for something different than the status quo, right? I mean, I think that there's a reason why if, if you look at the way that our parties are running right now, it's they're so polarized and, and they are, are playing to a base of their political uh, establishment as opposed to reaching out for a broader electorate. I mean, what do we do in the primaries? The left runs far to the left, the right runs far to the right, and they hope that they didn't go too far or too left uh, so they can meet somewhere in the middle for the general. But I think it's an intriguing idea. Again, full disclosure, Kasich's never talked to me about this, but you look at the Johns on the Sunday talk shows, and it's the world that all of us and Jonathan Capehart live in of who's on Meet the Press, who's on some of these Sunday talk shows, and they've been making the rounds of late, and they've been making the rounds taking their healthcare proposal around the country and trying to sell a different idea and trying to sell a new vision. And I've been in politics for 26 years. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't believe it's coincidental that they are doing this, that Kasich has outlined a new book, that these two governors have outlined a number of policy positions. I would guarantee you anything. Their lawyers are probably looking to see if it's viable to get them on the ballot and whether that's an even feasible um, or plausible possibility for them. Doug, what do, you, do you think that Democrats would vote for such a ticket? It depends on the message. I think that, let's put aside the Kasich-Hickenluber ticket and what you're asking whether or not would they would vote for a split ticket yeah I think I think certain yeah I think I think dem, dem, I, I don't know if you're if we're talking about a majority of the party but you don't need the majority of the party um, uh, but I think it, it you know it depends on what they're what the issues are that they're promoting and it depends on uh, and, and it really depends on the message uh, but you know we've seen instances you know there are not a lot of them but you know Jesse Ventura was a third party candidate he won the governorship in in Minnesota um, you know, Ross Perot did, he actually probably would have done much better if he didn't have several major slip-ups during the, the campaign in, in, uh, in 92. Um, so there, there have been instances, not a lot, um, where a uh, third-party candidate, Michael Bloomberg in New York, um, you know, uh, he ran, you know, he's sort of, he's, he's been a Democrat. He's been, I believe he's, I believe he's been a Democrat. He, I know he ran as a Republican mm -hmm. and I think he, I think he may have won he's, as an he's independent. Got all, he's got the trifecta. Yeah. yeah. So he's an independent. And, um, uh, you know, I do think that some of the challenges that Ron mentioned, just financial challenges and organizational challenges, would make a third party. I think if you were if you were someone with means, if you had money, I think running as a third party would be a little bit, it would probably be a little bit easier. And if you ran as sort of, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying a celebrity, but a business person like a Bloomberg or, um, you know, like a Howard Schultz or... Mark Cuban or some of these folks, you know, it might be a little bit easier just from an organizational standpoint and also from a fundraising standpoint because you just wouldn't have to deal with the traditional donors who give to, you know, who just give Democrat or give a Republican. If you have your own money, it sort of takes that, the the dependence on fundraising away. Um, so, but yeah, I think absolutely. I think it, but ultimately it depends on what the part, what that ticket stands for. So I actually I looked it up, and the Whigs, which was the last uh, third party, big major third party in the United States, um, began in response to Andrew Jackson, um, and Ron probably knows this better than I, uh, because they thought he was too authoritarian, um, and that and he was too um, him and his Treasury Secretary Gallatin were too um, uh, trying to stamp their will um, uh, on the people, and they their demise was um, actually slavery. Um, the issue of slavery completely divided them, and it gave Republicans and Abraham Lincoln, in particular, the opening to come in during the Civil War. So my question is, is there an issue, and this is for anybody who wants it, that is big enough to split either one of these parties enough that creates a, an opening big enough to get a third party in? And if that is, if there is one, what is the issue? You know, at the national level, it's really tough. I mean, just to sit at the table, you need $2 billion. Um, ballot access, as Ron talked about, is tough. Every state's really hard to qualify. Not every state, but there are states that make it really tough. Um, 
you know, you can probably get on 35 states fairly easily, then you're going to have to really work hard. Um, you know, in a two-party system, it's tough. Third parties have never done much because anytime they start to get any momentum, the, the two major parties grab just enough of their portfolio to kind of steal their thunder, thunder. So, you know, we've seen movements. So the only really third-party movement we've seen in the last 100 years has been personality-driven. So the question is, is there another Trump style politician who can, who can, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget, you know, you study this stuff and you see in August before the election, Hillary Clinton had spent something like a hundred and had put up 150,000 negative ads against Trump. He'd put up 13,000. Um, he had just fired his campaign manager. There was some, there was like just one of those weeks where it was like boom, boom, boom scandal and his numbers went up. And you're kind of like, you know, so, so you sit there and say maybe the traditional metrics, you throw them out the window, but let's, let's say that he's an anomalous, I, you know, building a national structure and, and a third party candidate is built on a very shaky premise of people who are like politics, parties, meh, showing up and putting your guy over the top. So, so on a scale of one to 10, we rank voters. So one is they never vote, 10 is they always vote. They vote for special elections for dog catcher. They're always there. You're counting on like three, fours, and fives to show up to vote for this thing that has never been done before. You know, you kind of say, "Boy, it had to be some something that I, I can't, I can't see what that issue is." I mean, that, that's a really tough. That's a really tough issue. Now, if there had been a third party in the past election with the negatives that both the, the major party candidates were carrying, I mean, Clinton had historic problems. I mean, going back to the 1800s parties holding the White House for three terms is really, really tough. And, 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 and Trump had, you know, his negatives should have disqualified him from even, even being close. But he wins, she loses. Now, if you had a viable third party candidate this time, I think they, they I think this was like a, a once in a lifetime kind of opportunity where if you saw a Bloomberg run, who had the money, who had the lawyers, who would have had a message, who actually had a record, I mean, the problem with business candidates is um, Trump is, in so many ways, so unique. But the business candidates don't generally do well because mm -hmm. business and government, it's like, it's like generals. And like they, like they're very good at one thing, and they have those, a lot of those skills don't translate, and they think they do. So, so it's tough to say. And that's where Bloomberg was so special because he was the business candidate who actually had run something really big in politics, too. So... I mean, I look at that as like a really unique time, and to say we're going to have those conditions again, um, if you believe the theory that Americans elect the opposite of what they have in the White House, Axelrod theory, <laughs> that our next president is going to be so boring and <laughs> such a technocrat that I really think that's, I mean, you know, I'd look at like an O'Malley again and say, you know, I mean, kind of boring, kind of lame, from like, <laughs> like a medium sized state, but kind of like, you know, knows government like that. My guess is kind of where the American people are going to want to head. Any thoughts on issues? Uh, I, to answer your original question, Jay, I think the answer is no. And, and, and the question posed was, was there a big enough issue that could transcend the sort of dual party system that we have such that it would allow for the creation of a third party? I, I genuinely off the top of my head can't think of an issue big enough that would bifurcate you know, the Republicans and the Democrats and give way to a rise of a third party. I like what Rob and, and Doug had said about someone like Michael Bloomberg. Uh, it was funny, I, I went to Kasich's book launch in New York City and it was held at Michael Bloomberg's house and the mayor was introducing Kasich and, and a reporter shouted out, uh, is this the ticket that is gonna run against President Trump for the next election? And Kasich, uh, without missing a beat, said, well, it depends which one of us is on the top of the ticket. <laughs> and I, I think that a billionaire, to your point, can hire the lawyers, can get folks to sign them up to get on the ballot, can find a way to get access to the ballot. It would be an intriguing possibility. I just don't think my former boss would do it. He, if you believe the accounts, Trump wanted him to be his vice president. We'll talk about that offline, off camera. Uh, but, but I would say to you that the dynamics are such with the politicians that we have who are out there with the access to resources that they have, Jay, I just don't believe that's a viable alternative at this juncture. Can, and can we just point out all of that, the challenges that have been outlined to a third party bid and what it would take with ballot access, with needing to have so much cash so quickly. 
that it's just hilarious that the RNC actually thought Trump could mount a third party bid successfully. <laughs> yeah. He wouldn't have shelled out the money. He wouldn't have been able to organize. He wouldn't have, it just, it just wouldn't have happened. But he would have had help from Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. Come on. I thought you were the nonpartisan moderator. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, a little. <laughs> so um, I, I want to I go back to your point, Elise, about um, policy here. And I think that the, that the Republicans had seven years to do an alternative for Obamacare, and they didn't do it. Um, and I remember when I first came to Washington, Congress actually produced a lot of legislation. I mean, like, they, they actually did stuff. And... And now it's like they can barely, you know, keep the government running and from us from defaulting from debt, and they just don't seem to legislate anymore. Um, and Trump spends a lot more time, you know, tweeting about like the desperate housewives of the Washington of the White House um, than than really anything having to do with policy. Is there? I mean, and everyone, you know, talks about how tax reform is probably. If not dying, then it probably won't happen this year. If it doesn't happen this year, it's even harder for it to happen next year. Is, is policy, is, is the art of policy making in Washington outside of executive order dying? I throw it up into what I mean. Uh, sure. Um, so I think I, I worked in Congress for um, three different House members and a senator uh, over the course of about eight or nine years. And I believe, I still believe in the institution, but I do think that there, there, are, th there are things that have, that have happened over the course of the last you know, 15, 20 years that have made the ability to cut deals and get things done harder. I'll bring up a couple, and I'm sure um, my esteemed panel can think of some others. But um, you know, for one, um, you know, the number of folks in the middle who have to, who are represent, who are, who would be, you know, who represent um, purple districts are fewer than they, than, than we've seen in a long time. So what you have is more members representing solid blue districts and solid red districts. So the number of folks in the middle who are willing to, comp to compromise and, and make deals and work together, there are fewer of those uh, members in the House and fewer of them, fewer of them in in the Senate, that the Senate is less about the redistricting issue, but more about the larger politics. Two, the outside money, um, super PACs um, that have arisen um, and forcing uh, forcing candidates to be um, to be more partisan, you know, to be sort of more um, die in the wool, either liberals or conservatives, uh, and making it so compromise is somewhat of a um, dirty word. Uh, the, f the third is uh, there used to be a time where, you know, members of Congress, House members could direct funding. They were called earmarks. Uh, a lot of people didn't like, uh, a lot of people liked them in the institution, but there was a, gr I think that they became, they began, to, they were seen as sort of a, a nasty thing when I actually think that, you know, part of what a member of Congress is supposed to do is look out for their district. Um, there was small, a few instances of abuse and it sort of wrecked the whole system. But what earmarks allowed people, uh, the, the leadership to do is to sort of um, make deals um, and, and uh, allow these members of Congress to take things home to their district. And that sort of jockeying doesn't exist anymore um, because earmarks don't exist anymore. And then the last thing is, is just a lot of members don't spend the same amount of time in Washington as they used to. So they aren't spending a lot of time with each other. And so, and that's a problem because they're not personal relationships, you know, and you know, I have, a, I have a number of Republicans who are friends of mine who, you know, I bet if we sat down and sort of if we had to come up with a, you know, a solution to some of these, you know, to issues, say the ACA, we probably could because we have a personal relationship and we would be able to work things out. I think that's the case in business. That's in case in a lot of different fields that personal relationships do matter. And I think especially with the significant turnover we've seen in the House over the last, um, you know, the last eight years, six to eight years, as well as the fact that you know they aren't spending a lot of time together anymore makes it hard for that trust, which is a word that I think has been brought up pretty consistently today, uh, to be to be um, developed and um, for big things to happen. Whether it's the you know the deal that the president and Speaker Boehner were trying to do, or whether it's something on ACA, or whether it's tax reform, or whatever it is, um, you know that trust doesn't exist. Until that trust is restored, I think doing big 
policy issues are it's going to be really hard and it'll likely be just done on a sort of party line basis yeah no i agree with what doug said it, mm -hmm. uh, i mean i would have from a republican point of view i'd give the same speech i mean the barrier for entry in the 50s 60s 70s and 80s to impact news was you had to build a newspaper and you had to make buy printing presses and have people run them and deliver the newspapers and it was an expensive process and then you saw the rise of the internet where someone could have a blog which says this person's not doing and and all of a sudden you saw that movement morph into partisan tv um, which spends billions of dollars saying you know not only is congress bad but trust us over them because we're watching them so you don't have to kind of thing so you see the, the institutions starting to be pulled apart. So they say, we need more sunlight. Yeah, we gotta get rid of these earmarks. We gotta, you know, we gotta clean up the party system and we, we have to pretend we can you know, take money out of politics. I mean, let's not forget ourselves. Uh, 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 John Kerry, which was pretty recent, ran for president and spent $92 million. Mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton spent 2.5 billion. Mm -hmm. Romney spent a billion. It's not, I'm not making a partisan point, I'm just trying to chart the growth explosion of political spending. We still spend $4 billion a month on chocolate, so there's an argument to me, do we spend enough on politics? <laughs> but um, set that aside is that, you know, um, you have the institution and then you have the rise of super PACs, which are personality driven, because we, we took the power out of the parties. The parties are starving for cash, um, the super PACs aren't. Um, and I mean, it's a screwed up thing that in, in order to divorce the politicians from the money, we now have Kay Hagan and Tom Tillis ran in North Carolina as $120 million, and their combined spending was 23% of the <laughs> combined spending. So imagine if you were going to get in an argument with your spouse, and you, not only you had to do it in front of the family, but they got to say more about why your sports, spouse was right or wrong than you did, and not by a little bit. <laughs> of 10 arguments, you get to make one, and everyone else gets to make other arguments. I mean, you can imagine, A, I spent two years of my life trying to recruit people to run for the Senate. And they look at it and you see really talented people and they're just like, I don't want to be a part of this. I'm not blaming just super PACs, but you know, you see these kind of really fundamental things that were a part of our strong legislative history. And the other thing is, is in the last decade, being incumbent is bad. Oh, I've been gone to Washington there too long. Well, okay, fine. But the downside of that is you lose your legislators. Mm -hmm. 62 Republicans had been around when W had been president. 62 out of, out of we have a conference of 232 or something like that. 62 have been, have been there eight or more years. So if you take the Washington edge that takes 10 years to move anything big in D.C., 10 years. John McCain spent 10 years trying to pass campaign finance reform. We can argue if that was a good idea or not. But he'll, you know, he spent 10 years. If two-thirds of your legislature haven't even been there for 10 years, how do they even know how to legislate? I mean... There is something to be said that, you know, you lose that talent and maybe old and gone to Washington and, you know, okay, but, you know, you got to know how to, lobby, how, to build, how to build legislation that can sustain 60 votes. And, and that's kind of the frustration I have as a political professional when I was doing it is, you know, we send all these great candidates to Washington and, you know, I see them now and they're like, I'm so frustrated, I can't get anything done. And, you know, and kind of my response was, you know, my, my job was to get you in the door, <laughs> like, I'm done. Like, <laughs> but but I, I, I understand their pain in that, that this, it's not a great lifestyle. I think a lot of people think, oh, to be a senator would be awesome. But, you know, it's a tough job. You have a lot of work to do. And at the end of the day, you, if you're not going to, if you're going to go through all that sacrifice, being away from your family, have 49.1% of the state, like, hate you, <laughs> you know, I mean, like, I, like, there's, there's easier ways to live a life, let's just say. And then to not have any accomplishments, it's, it is really kind of soul-sucking in, in, in many ways. And I, and I hear that frustration. Um, and there's a lot of ways we could pose on how to fix it. But, you know, it's just, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we have to get through this as a republic and then we'll get to the other side. I don't know. <laughs> and being a House member, I mean... <laughs> You mentioned the, the Senate. Being a House member in a, a frontline Democrat, that's what we call our sort of competitive districts, our frontline districts, or in a, a, a vulnerable House Republican, I mean, that's, that's even worse because these mm -hmm. guys are constant. I mean, they're just, it, they never stop. They just raise money. They all, they, I mean, I was at the DCCC in, in, in uh, 06 and then working closely with sort of new members and vulnerable members and, I'm sorry, in, o, in 08 and then in 10. And, I, you know, we were having fundraising conversations with our members 
um, in December, you know, and like with our vulnerable members, like you gotta, we need you to raise, you need to be at 250 first quarter, right? And every week they'd come in front of, you know, the DCCC leadership and it were every other week and it was like, how you doing, right? And so they have to do call time, right? Which takes a ton of, you know, ton of hours away from them, you know, potentially going to committee hearings and it's it's just a, the house lifestyle is even worse. It's, even worse. I mean, it's just you, the, all, it all you is get the is worst. good good health care, and I think they give it to themselves for life too. So that's not true. Actually. <laughs> they don't get the <laughs> no. and they don't get free haircuts. No, um, but um, but you you know you t we, we were talking about Nixon earlier, and if you look at Nixon's schedule, he would spend like six hours a day just kind of like unscheduled reading and thinking, and I mean. That, I mean, you kind of think like he wasn't working hard enough, but you're kind of like, my God, it would be kind of nice to have our leaders like actually like read a book and like think like deep thoughts about stuff. But instead, they have to live this lifestyle where it's like, I have a committee vote, I have 22 minutes for lunch, then I have to go raise money for four hours, and I have to come back and vote at night, and then I have a fundraiser that night. And, and it's like, you know, uh, when people sit there and say, oh, Congress is not working that hard in such a cush lifestyle, I'm like, follow them around for a day then. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. There's some who figure out how to be lazy. They really, but you have there to kind of go. Out, you kind of have to go out of your way to do that. I mean, the, and the, most of those folks are in safe seats. If they, yeah, if, if exactly. there are lazy members, and I don't think there are a lot of them, but if they are, they're in safe seats. But to these folks who have yes. to, I mean, who are in competitive seats, there is no time to have no established time to, yeah. any relationships with anyone. They're going to caucus meetings. They've got meetings with the leadership. I mean, it just becomes, and they're just not in D.C. that much. And when they are, it's just all about how they come back. So I, I agree with, with what my friends have said for the last several minutes, and I, I would offer my perspective this way. I think the, if you look at the last year that the Congress passed all 12 of the appropriations bills before the new fiscal year starts on October 1st, it's like 70, so, it? oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> so the fiscal year starts on October 1st and it ends on September 30th. The last time that, that happened, that they actually did it on time where they didn't have to punt down and they didn't have to get a continuing resolution to fund the government lest it shut down, was 1996. 1996. And what did Doug tell us and, and what did Rob share with us is the elimination of earmarks. And I remember every month sitting in the Ohio delegation meetings, all 22 senators, 18 House members would sit in a room, bless you, and Marcy Kaptur, <clears throat> Marcy Kaptur, the senior Democrat in the Appropriations Committee, and Dave Hobson, the most senior person from Ohio in the Appropriations Committee, would sit there and say, so what do we need for our state? And they would talk, not as Republicans and Democrats, but members of the Ohio delegation. Marcy Kaptur would go back to her leadership and say, here's what we need for our state. Dave Hobson would go back and say to the Republicans, here's what we need for our state. And they got it done. And they got it done, not that it was you know, the bridge to nowhere and all these other terrible projects, but they got it done because that's what their constituents needed. But they sat and they talked together as Republicans and Democrats representing their constituents. You take that incentive away, what are they gonna talk about? As Doug just said, that, that, you know, your average member flies in on Monday night, maybe if their vote's after five or Tuesday, they're there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. What are they doing? They're spending all their time dialing for dollars. I, I used to literally carry Kasich's cell phone, which was a disaster in its own right, but that's another story. And you're not allowed to fundraise on federal property. And so literally, you're dragging your member to the sidewalk to make sure that you're 22 feet away from a federal building, because now you're not on federal property. And it's like, fire it up, John, here's the list. And you're walking over the DCCC, the Democratic campaign, Congressional Campaign Committee, our version is the NRCC, the National Republican Campaign Committee, and you're dialing for dollars, and you take them over there, and you're dialing for two hours, then you bring them back, there's a vote, then they go to a caucus meeting, and they come. They don't have time to know their colleagues. And I, I dare say, 1995, when we came in, Newt Gingrich had the scorched earth policy of, you know, we're running against Washington. Well, if you're running against Washington, you're running against each other. And you look at the productivity, I had to check the number on this, I was telling this to my students last night, there are so many bills that are introduced now for ideological reasons of, well, I have to look good to the base, or I have to look strong for my, my partisans. There were 10,078 bills introduced in the last session of Congress that ended on January 19th of this year. Of the 10,078 bills, 
President Obama only signed 329 that made it to his desk. I say that as being demonstrative of Congress is playing to their audiences and not playing to work together. And that, and by and large, taking away the incentive to work together leads to a lot of our dysfunction, let alone the amount of money they have to raise. Um, I want to move on to, I mean, we're going to come back to that, the, the, those points in a minute, but I, I want to just talk a little bit about the Tea Party um, and, and also about Democrats in this case, because you know, the, the bridge to nowhere existed during Bush's era, right? Like the beginnings, the roots of the Tea Party began in the Bush administration, um, but they burst into fruition. They really burst into the public scene when Democrats, or when Republicans went into the minority, when Obama won, and there suddenly became this huge Tea Party movement, just burst into life. Um, and a lot of people have predicted that the same thing would happen with Democrats. Now the Democrats are in the minority and, they're, and Obama's out of power, and that the simmering discontent that you saw with Bernie Sanders um, in the election, in, you know, in 2016, would, would burst into this movement of de the Democratic Tea Party. Do you think that is going to happen? Is that happening right now? And so there is a, a lot of energy out there on, on the Democratic side of things. I personally, I think we're giving a little too much credit to Bernie Sanders. I think he he ran a fantastic race, but um, you know, I mentioned a poll that I saw in New Hampshire and Iowa earlier, and he's not. He's doing just as well as, you know, he's at, he's really not running away with New Hampshire or Iowa right now. He's, he's right around where, you know, Biden and a few other folks are. So, it, you know, I don't think he has this like, significant amount of popularity, nor do I think he is the, the leader of the Democratic Party. Um, I'm not entirely sure if he's a member of the party right now. Um, uh, but he has brought up issues that do resonate with, um, the base, not just single payer, but things related to paying for college and taking on Wall Street, things like that. Uh, but I do think that there is a lot of energy out there um, that the party hasn't seen for a while uh, that uh, began with uh, the Women's March in, um, in January. And that certainly wasn't a party exercise. That just was you know, individuals, millions and millions of, of, of men and women around the country who got together because they were, you know, because of, uh, in part due to the election. And then I think you also saw the energy generated by um, a lot of folks who were upset and angry about how the uh, uh, Trump care bill was being pushed through Congress and what it would do. And not just Democrats, independents and Republicans. And so I think that has created uh, a lot of energy out there, more energy than you know, I think ener energy that is similar to what we saw in 2010. Uh, I don't think it has like a, for you know, it doesn't have yet, um, you know, a, 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 I think an, uh, the same sort of organization around it that the Tea Party had, even though they were sort of split off factions. There just was, there seemed to be a bit more, um, you know, you had a name for it. Like on our side, you know, it's just a lot of people who are very frustrated with, uh, what they're seeing as uh, Trump's Trump's uh, Trump's America, and um, and and I think that is helping out a lot of Democratic candidates raise money. You're seeing a lot of energy around um, candidates running in the House. Uh, we have 400 plus candidates, I think, running in House campaigns. Now that creates a situation where there may be primaries, which we can argue whether or not is good or bad. But there is a lot of energy. You know, when you're looking at you know, some good indicators of the, the energy that exists within a party, you've got to take a look at whether or not the, the party is able to recruit candidates. And I think right now the, the, the Democrats are doing a good job of that and whether they're able to raise money. And I think if we saw in a couple of the special elections, even though the Democrats won, uh, lost, I'm sorry, we, the candidates in Georgia and in Montana were able to raise a lot of money. Uh, and that's a, and grassroots money. So that's a good indication of the um, of the energy out there, the question is whether or not it, it is that they can direct it in the ways that Republicans ultimately were able to direct that energy that you saw with the Tea Parties to um, winning back the majority. And um, I think that's an open question because I think that a lot of these folks don't necessarily align themselves with the Democratic Party quite yet. I think that they're trying to force some changes within the party as well. Um, but the, but ultimately, it's going to be up to, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, others who are in charge of the, you know, the formal party apparatus to figure out how these people can be embraced, that their ideas can um, be heard, and how they can direct that energy into winning, uh, winning campaigns. 
and they certainly don't seem to be doing that right now with their insistence on preserving leadership that is just outdated and a great Republican fundraising machine. It, the insistence to stick by Nancy Pelosi, just it just baffles me. It's insane. It, I do not get it. It's like Democrats are saying, how can I lose? And just actively making that choice to continue down a path that, uh, you know, it's almost so similar to the insistence on nominating Hillary Clinton as for their as their party's nominee, just because she had been for decades had so many negatives just piled up, and that's what the situation that Pelosi is in at this point. And uh, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, that's a misogynistic viewpoint. You're trying to bump out a woman." Do you, you know, it's the difference in winning and... Well, I, I would just, the only, the, you know, I, what I would just say is that if there are, in the House Democratic Caucus, if there are people, if there is someone who believes that they can be a better leader than Nancy Pelosi, no one is stopping them from running for that leadership election. Isn't Seth, isn't Seth Malkin a challenger? We've had, there have been a couple, but it's not well, like anyone is saying right. you can't challenge her. Ultimately, it's up to these folks in the party. You know, if you're a House Democrat and you have a real problem with, if you have a problem with Nancy Pelosi's leadership, then put together a campaign and beat her. Well, but Doug, it's easier said than done. Though. I, I mean, know, I know, but right? I'm just saying it's not like Nancy Pelosi is saying you can't run or you can't. She she has demonstrated over the course of her career, and an ability an ability to not only pass legislation but also raise a lot of money. And she has been, despite what I think Republicans say about her, she has been a very effective leader for the House Democratic Caucus. Now, if at the end of the day there is, there is someone out there that thinks they can be better, then they should run against her. But these, these, these critiques of her, well, she has some sort of stranglehold. She only has a stranglehold. If you want to, if you want to replace her, then put together a campaign and beat her. Well, but no one sees it as a priority. Well, the, or an the, impediment. But that's winning. not. Her, but that's. I, I guess I'm saying I'm like. She's we been, use the word ins, in insistence upon the, the that there has been insistence by leadership to keep the same leadership. No, it's not that. It's that we haven't seen people in the part. You know, we haven't seen someone who can, who can, who could within the House Democratic Caucus. Who has been able to put together that coalition in that out in in that in that campaign to take to, to beat her, can, and can that's it, not her fault. I mean, can, she's can, doing everything that she can. To, I mean, can, I'm not sure if she should just step away just because, you know, people like you know us are saying whatever we want. I mean, you got to put together a campaign and beat you know and win. Easier said than done, my friend, against the juggernaut. And 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 here's the reality. Most senior members in the House have something which is called a leadership pack, a political action committee, and you can donate $5,000 to a leadership pack. Nancy Pelosi has amassed a huge war chest that if you're a guy like Tim Ryan, he represents Eastern Ohio, he represents the Mahoning Valley, which is up against the Pennsylvania border near uh, Pennsylvania. Very conservative, very, very blue collar, a lot of Catholic population, a lot of pro-life population, and if a person like that who is in his 40s can't run against a Senate and House leadership structure on the Democrat side that's in their mid-70s, then you've got a problem. And I think the problem is that he's been boxed out knowing that a lot of the Democrats in the House would never lend their support to him, knowing that Pelosi and her party machine would turn the money spigot off. I, I, all I'm saying is, is that it's not. It, is, so, are we arguing that Nancy Pelosi shouldn't raise money for her PAC or for her part? I mean, all, my point is, is that we can argue whether or not there needs to be change within the leadership. That's fine. I think for having fresh voices is 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 a good thing. I, I would also point out that you know Mitch McConnell isn't a spring chicken either. Um, but um, and neither is the president of the United States, who's um, older, uh, who's in his seventies. But my point is, is that ultimately. Democrats in the House need to, you know, if, if there, someone needs to stand up and put together that, that, that campaign, it can be done. It's hard. I get that. But it's not, in, it's not Nancy Pelosi's job to sort of step away if she still, feel, if she still feels like she can lead the party. It, it, She's got to have trust that someone can take the baton from her. Here's the difference between our caucus rules and the Democrat caucus rules. We say that you can't be in leadership for more than six years if you're a Republican in the House. 
that you're term limited out, that you have to go after six years. The Democrats have no such mechanism in place in the House. And I think it would be healthy for the party. It's healthy for us. There's certainly a lot of the old bulls in the House of Representatives who are Republicans who didn't want to go anywhere. But you're like, hey, man, six years out of the pool. It's time for somebody else to get a, ch a chance to get in there. And I think Pelosi, the way that the rules are structured in the House Democratic Caucus, she has an iron grip in the party as long as she wants to stay. What, what you're seeing is, is actually interesting because it's the clash of two, two cultures in the sense that re, when I was in Republican leadership, we used to marvel at how the Democrats are very united and they never beat each other up in the press. Maybe you'd say never is not the right word, but from our perspective, where House and Senate Republican leadership, it's like every, every day <laughs> yes. we, we take more fun beating, beating each, each other, other up than beating Democrats sometimes. <laughs> yep. And so their discipline... Um, I think helps them, but maybe in this instance it's hurting them because we have a much more dynamic. Um, you lose the majority on the Republican side, you're out. Dick, Dick Gephardt never delivered the majority and he stayed until he was ready to leave. Pelosi lost the majority and she stayed. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what's a better system. I think, um, I think my guess is she's probably coming to the conclusion of her career, but you never know. She is one of the best, um, House politicians you'll ever meet. And ever. She, I mean, yeah. she is so the, effective. The, dyna, the dynamic, her dynamic and nimble way that she handles her caucus, and it has changed dramatically. I mean, just look at the California delegation um, in the last 15 years, how much that delegation has changed. And she has kept a hammerlock on, on uh, that uh, uh, caucus. I, I think so. I want to just, I mean, we're going to, I want to sum everything up and ask the panel a last question before we. we throw this open to questions from the audience. And I think that we're hearing a lot of frustrations on both sides of the aisle and like a lot of, and a lot of similar frustrations, right? That, and why the parties are broken and why the party systems are broken. And, and a lot of that is, you know, they spend more time dialing for dollars on both sides of the aisle. They, they don't, can't, they can't forge relationships with each other. They, they don't know each other. Um, they can't work, work across the aisle. I think, you know, earmarks, the loss of earmarks has been a big problem because there's no incentive for anybody to do anything. Um, I would add to that list closed primaries. Um, you know, it's like the craziest 3,000 people swing a vote in every district. And, like, do you really want those people picking you um, for, for the, the, the candidates for Congress? And gerrymandered districts, you know, and these districts that look like some insane Indian headdress. Um, and, like, and, and so these are all sort of the problems that we're facing my question to the panel is how do we, you know, we pretty much earlier in this panel ruled out the idea that we're going to get a third party system or in here anytime soon. So if we don't have a third party that comes in, how do we fix the parties that we have? Is it is it by, um, do we have a, I mean, what Bannon wants, a continental congress where we completely rewrite the rules of our government. Um, what, what are your solutions I'd like to hear? I still am of the position it's going to continue to get worse before it gets better. Uh, I think that, you know, we might see the pendulum shift dramatically in another direction uh, in terms of 2020, uh, whether that direction is a technocrat or a far left uh, personality, you know, who knows. Uh, I wonder, though, that voter disgust with government and the inability for anything to get done, it does make me think that a technocratic style candidate would uh, you know be, be viewed favorably whether uh, you know someone like Mike Bloomberg who I just miss him every day in New York City he was such a great mayor and the city was running so well and so functional and uh, but there are very few business people who can do that uh, well you know I'm actually looking forward to 2020 in a big field I think um, the last time the Democrats had a really big field uh, was in 2008 and um, and, you know, obviously we know what happened there. Um, and then the Republicans had a big field in 2016, and they won. Um, so I think having a big field of candidates just fighting it out with one another and getting their ideas out there is, is, is productive. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, I, it, even just minor things, like one of the things that kind of just bothered me about 2016 is that Republicans had, I, I don't know how many debates they had. They had so many, they had a lot of debates in the beginning, right? So... And they were on primetime TV during the week. And all it was, and they, and you know, most of the time they were, they were sort of, they were um, uh, criticizing the policies 
of Barack Obama. There was a bunch of exchanges between each other and, you know, they had to define themselves. But a lot of it was just them going after the, you know, Obama's agenda and what he did. Disagreed with a lot of what they said, but there was no rebuttal. Like, we didn't have an opportunity. We had, I don't know how many date, debates we had. We had like three or four. But there were only, there were a few Democratic debates. And and they weren't at the, they weren't prime time. They were, they were prime time, but they just, so what you had was this situation where Republicans were generating very large audiences for their debates. They were, I think, doing a good job of motivating their both base voters, but also getting out there an argument about um, uh, the, the current, uh, the sort of the status quo. And we basically didn't, there was no real solid rebuttal with uh, the same number of debates, uh, which I think if we had, say, six or seven candidates in it, might have sort of um, helped sort of um, diminish, I think, I, I think that was a very effective piece of that camp. I think the debates helped, Demo uh, helped the Republicans get their message out. And um, so I, I'm a bit, I, I think having, I think having um, a, a, a big primary uh, in 2020 with a, a variety of candidates will be helpful, if only because there will be a lot of debates and people will be able to hear uh, in part what Democrats are fighting for and standing for, but also it'll be able, it'll, it'll be an opportunity for them to make their case against um, President Trump and how he has led the country. That's why I love this place because I hear I hear an argument that I'm like because I think Republicans really viewed him as a family fight that was dragged out for months and months and months mm -hmm. and they hated it. They hated like the the sharpest elbowed voices in our party having a platform to say things that were like such a turn off to what we figured a general election. So that's really interesting. That's why I like coming here because I I hear a totally different perspective on the same thing that I saw and went through and I came away with a totally different conclusion. And maybe you're right. I, n I never really thought about it as kind of a, for once the mainstream media letting Republicans have an unfiltered kind of hour or two hours or on Fox and three and a half. I don't know that remember that debate. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like even if never ending debate. I was there and the <laughs> candidates were like, when is this thing ending? Um, um, but uh, um, that's it. Fascinating. Um, but I think I think your question is uh, was you know how can we make things more more governable for the American people. And, um, I've heard a lot of politicians talk to very rich people and, and, and very poor people talk about this. And um, I don't know that anyone has a solution. I think, you know, the Atlantic had, uh, I'll leave with the students, I'll give you two reading assignments. One was a Politico interview, Politico Magazine's first magazine did a interview with Bobby Baker. He was a Democrat kind of behind the scenes operator. And it's a fascinating read about everything that was going on there, and, and you have to read it. But then there was another piece that was in the Atlantic, and I, I'm sorry, I can't, I, I can't think of what it was. But they talk about the death of middlemen in DC, and the, the death of smoke-filled rooms, and how, this is Atlantic's right this, and how it's been a tragedy. And it gets to the earmark issue, it gets to, because, because when you had strong parties and strong leadership, it controlled the, the excesses of ego. And once we got rid of that, we've seen a, an explosion of ego. So instead of being, I'm going to be the best Republican or Democrat, you're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to actually be bigger than that, and I'm going to be this thing. So we saw it in smaller scale, um, and 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 for my Democratic friends, I would remind them that we didn't really have a problem with the Tea Party. The Tea Party was our friend in six and eight, and then ten, it started to wobble, and then twelve, it was out with right warfare. So these things take years to manifest themselves in, in, in a way that you can figure out if they're friend or foe, but you know. That is all directly. We kind of pulled out these these supports that kind of checked ego, and it checked um, self ambition, and it kind of made politics more of a collaborative thing, both internally and eventually externally. Because, and you're, I think you're going to see it with if if my instincts are right, you're going to see Democrats vote because for the very same reasons that Democrats in red states that went for Trump, some by double digits, need accomplishments to go home and talk about and say, I got things done for you, even though I'm a Democrat, and and. You know, we've moved away from that, and I don't know how you put it back together because at this very conference, I've talked to leading people who ran presidential campaigns about how do we just do a little thing like fix our campaign system. And these are my friends, and, and we couldn't even, you know, we tried, we, we tried, and we couldn't even get to stage one because uh, there's just such fundamental disagreements about how we finance campaigns, and um, so it's tough. I mean, these are really, really tough things to do, and. And that's where you always we've always relied on a strong executive, um, and um, for
from a congressional perspective, this is a partisan statement. I don't think Obama was a strong president with regards to his relationship with Congress. Um, and, you know, it's the, the, the book is still out on this current presidency, but we can agree it's, I think Trump would agree, it's been a rocky relationship. And um, you need strong leaders like Clinton, like Bush, who can get people into a room and either through force, force of personality, force of threat, force of whatever, walk out of the room with progress. And that's been, that's been a challenge. You know, I, I want to echo what Rob said, listening to what Doug said a few moments ago. You know, you come here and you think, you know, I've got my perspective and here's what I'm going to offer. And, and then you take a step back. And I had the same exact impression that you did, Rob, about what you said, Doug, about the, the, the debates and, and what we went through in the last cycle. And I was having a Kasich's debate coach for that cycle. And I, I, your, your, your commentary just made me think of, we spent so much time in debate prep thinking how we're going to stop Trump, how we're going to say all these bad things that he's doing as opposed to all the good things that his, I mean, our whole focus was bad, 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 as opposed to the good things that he had done. And it, you look back and you're like, gosh, how could we have been so stupid? And we should have run a different campaign. And, and, I, and I say run a different campaign in that a guy like John Kasich, who is in a state that is a swing state, won 86 out of 88 counties, got 40% of the black vote, got well over 40% of the Hispanic vote, and he didn't say, I'm going to go for uh, high school educated white Catholics. He said, I'm going to fight for every constituent. I'm going to go to all 88 counties, and I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to ask for the vote, and I'm going to tell them what I'm for, I'm going to tell them what I've done, and hope that that works. You look at the most popular governor in the United States, it's a Republican, Charlie Baker in Massachusetts, of all places. And the Massachusetts phenomena isn't just limited to there. You look, you have a Republican in Vermont, you have a Republican in New Hampshire. It demonstrates that if you are a conservative living in a blue state, you can get it done. But how do you get it done? Not by trying to tear people down, but trying to be constructive and build a governing agenda up. And I just think one of the ways that we end this is Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, is a friend of mine, and he said, now, how do you ex expect, Ron, the Senate to work if the following scenario happens? We go home on Thursday, I go home on Friday. Well, a Republican flies in my district, beats the hell out of me on Friday night at a fundraiser, beats the daylights out of me on Saturday, really strings me up on Sunday, comes back to Washington and says, hey, Joe, do you want to co-sponsor my bill? After he's been in my state trashing the hell out of me for the last three and a half days. And I think that we need to find a way to regain our civility amongst ourselves and civility in the way that our legislators interact with each other. Because if you're going to go and you're going to say that someone's the devil incarnate and then come back to Congress and think that they're going to work with you on a piece of legislation, it ain't going to happen. So a return to civil discourse, I think, demonstrates that you can be a Republican in a blue state, you can be a Democrat in a red state, but if your ideas resonate with people, you can win. Yeah, and it's hard to work with someone that you've called the devil, right? So yeah. if, you, if you spend your whole time calling, whether it's Obama or whoever it is, calling, making them into something beyond, if it's, they're very bad, they're the devil, they're a socialist, it's hard for you to actually work with that person, yeah, right? Because why would you? Unless you're right. Donald Trump. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's power. There's that, and it's all back to Donald Trump. That's his power. Um, all right, I, we, I, we we could go on like this for a long time, but um, I want to open it up to questions again. The students have priority, and then please uh, make sure that your question comes in the form of a question and not a long rambling comment. Um, so, any questions? There's one right here. So this is related to the Democratic Party and with 2020 the election coming up. So I was saying. Um, as a party trying to form a cohesive character or message, how do you reconcile Pelosi-style fundraising with Sanders-style fundraising? Well, you know, I think uh, when Pelosi first took over the party, um, I think it was 12 or 13 years ago, um, she, had a, she was very much committed to changing the way in which the party raised money because this came after, she took over right after campaign finance reform. And Democrats, um, were, were dependent upon those soft money donors. Uh, and so uh, there was a big concern that Republicans would, would lap us because of we just, we didn't raise the same, we didn't raise grassroots money and in individual donations in the same way that um, Republicans did. And so she t totally changed and revamped how the party raised money and was uh, 
um, and looked at uh, both um, raising money from individual, new individual donors and grassroots donors and investing in um, raising money online. And uh, it really totally revamped how the DCCC, which is the campaign arm for the House Democrats, raise money. And now the DCCC pretty regularly outraises the NRCC. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a, you know, that was a, a huge achievement on her part. Um, and, you know, I think that there is, uh, there's lessons to be learned from how Bernie Sanders raised money in sort of like these $20, $30 increments that uh, the party really should look at. And he was, you know, in part, a lot of it had to do with, you know, his personality, but it did have to do with the issues that he was running on. And so I think we, I think we, some of our candidates in Georgia, uh, the Georgia special, again, we lost that, but, you know, he was able to uh, raise a significant amount of small dollar donations. Uh, so was our candidate in Montana. So I think we are taking a lot of lessons from Bernie. But I, I, I want to, you know, I want to give Pelosi a lot of credit here because she really changed how the party raised money and became, we became less dependent upon, you know, the, a lot of the, you know, sort of the, you know, the corporate dollars, especially when once soft money got out of the system and focus much more on raising grassroots dollars online and also from individual donors. I would just say one thing, which is, I think if, if, if I could channel Pelosi for a second, which is always trouble, um, dangerous. Um, I think she would say, um, she does do a lot and she, her grassroots arm is not her. It's, it's really the D triple C and they have the best, the biggest grassroots fundraising list in the world. Mm. Um, but also I think, you know, and I, I say this from a, not a Republican point of view, but I will cite the Republicans so as not to be too partisan. Um, there's a lot of people who can generate a lot of money online, but they don't win. And I think Pelosi could make a pretty strong argument that she wins. And Bernie did a lot. He really energized a part of the Democratic base. That was great. But ultimately, he didn't win. Um, and we see that where our, our fringe candidates raise a ton of money, and it makes them really hard to beat. But they don't win generals. And so you always have to balance that out, which is, you know, you wish you could get a dollar from every one of your voters, and, and that's all you needed. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes to get those dollars, you have to pivot so far away from kind of where you're, where you're a winning strategy um, that you kind of become a, a creature of, you know, the best example is probably uh, Ron Paul, not Rand Paul, but his dad when he ran. He raised insane amount of money. I mean, he'd have five million dollar days when that was still a lot of money. You know, he had like and, the Goodyear blimp. I mean, it was, it was like <laughs> it was amazing. They had so much money, but his ideas were so narrow that he, while he had passion, he didn't have wit. You know, he had depth, but he had wit, and he wasn't able to get one delegate. I, I would just I would add to that um, that I wrote a story for Time in two thousand nine called "Welcome to the Circus." Um, and it was about, we profiled um, Michelle Bachman and Alan Grayson. So Alan Grayson was a Democratic congressman, Michelle Bachman was a Republican one, but they had both figured out how to rig the system, right? Like, and I think everybody does this now, certainly Bernie does it, but they would say something, they would go to the, the House floor, and it basically the story argues that C-SPAN has kind of helped destroy Washington. <laughs> but they like, um, and I'm all for open, uh, you know, openness and transparency, and I think C-SPAN's done a lot of great things, but I think in some ways, because it's made such a theater out of, you know, everything that's done, like, you can no longer compromise on camera anymore, right? Like, the minute you do, it's an advertisement that's used against you, um, you know, in, in November. Um, but anyway, they figured out this th the system where they would go to the House floor during one minute, which is every morning they get up and House members have one minute to say whatever they want to say. They would say something completely outrageous and bombastic, um, something that would never get done. It was like totally like outside the norm. And then they would go on cable television, either on Fox News or MSNBC, and they'd double down and say it again. And then they would and they would have like a website up and ready to run and like and then they would just collect a million dollars and in in, in in like it was a money bomb basically it's what they called it um, and that was how they fundraised I mean like that's literally and it was so powerful that it, like it became this really normal thing in Washington to do that and and it's and that's I think part of the problem is this hyper um, this use of like hyper language like I mean just like the you know like things are never going to get done it's like these crazy ideas. Um, and 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 making them almost normal and like getting people to give you a ton of money in order to do it when in fact you can't actually achieve it, right? Um, and so I think that you see that with the president, you see that with to some degree Bernie and his four trillion dollar health care plan, which I think 
be great if we can enact single payer, but it's never going to happen. And like, and so, um, you know, the, and that's I think part of the hard thing in Washington is that there's just not enough people because it's so boring talking about like actual compromise and things we can actually feasibly get done because it's not it's just not a it's politically more dangerous to talk about the, the reality and the, and the compromise but then b it also isn't interesting. Thank you. Um, so in light of the claims against. Um, Trump um, accusing him of being a misogynist and accusing him of all of these things. How do we think the um, the GOP will recover from this and gather the voters that they need? Well, they recovered pretty well. They won. <laughs> well, yeah. They <laughs> does the women vote matter all that much? I, whoa, whoa, whoa! I would dispute that. <laughs> uh, I'll be curious about midterm midterm turnout with women and whether it is a passing, uh, you know, trend. The mobilization, you know, that we saw with the huge marches around the country, whether those women will actually turn out in greater numbers than in the past in the midterms. It, uh, I'm betting that I do think the country is more politically mobilized right now. And I think that the polarization that we've been talking about is going to probably mean that there is higher turnout. How much is it enough to you know, have real impact? That's uh, a question that's better, for the, better left to the forecasters at the table. Yeah, I mean, we've always had a historic gender gap. Um, that's always been a challenge for Republicans. Part of is, Kind of how how we talk and how we need to be better. Um, I think Trump is kind of the American people have a very fascinating view of their politicians, where they feel like they have a personal relationship. If you if you, if you study them in your focus group and you talk to them in groups, they feel like they have a personal connection with their president, and they feel second is their senator and third is their House of Con member of Congress. When in reality, the member of Congress probably, statistically speaking, probably their kids went to a similar or same school as them. They shop in the same place. They live within 10 miles of their congressman. They probably have met their senator maybe once or twice, and they've never met their president. So it's like this weird inverse relationship. So I haven't studied it, but I, my, my gut is is that people have, the American people, when they voted for Trump, like I said, there was 180 years of, of historical trends going against Clinton anyway. but. I think that they baked into the equation that Trump is this thing, and and define it how you want, and so it it it, it kind of is why he can do things that no other politician in my lifetime has ever done. The things he said that he gets away with, because um, I think the American people have kind of just said, "Yep, I I know he's all these things. Here's a, a basket of things that we've never had in a president, but I'm gonna. I, so I know when I buy this, this comes with it." But they, they made that mental jump and said, I'm still buying. So I think that's, so the question, your question was uh, how the Republicans get women vote uh, back. I'm not sure we've actually opened up. I've not seen any study that says we've opened up a gap uh, with Republican women that's outside the historic, I'm sorry, a Republicans have opened up a gap with women that is outside the historic norm. I'm, there, it was in the last election. No, no, I'm saying right now. Oh, okay. I'm saying I'm saying I don't I, I haven't seen any data that says our usual ten to twelve point gap with women is now it's twenty gone. and it's sustained. Now yeah. they, now Trump's numbers may be twenty points with women, but that's Trump. It's not the Republican generic kind of any Republican versus any Democrat where are women kind of behaving. From what I've seen, and I, I'm not every day in politics anymore, so I don't see the numbers as closely as I used to. I haven't seen a, 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 a what I would say a historic realignment with women. <laughs> As Republican, I worry about that, though. So I don't want to sound like I don't care, but I'm just saying, um, I think uh, Trump, because he's he's so he's he is Trump that he he uh, has separated. I guess I mean I I want to I'll, I'll weigh in on this one just because I wrote a book about women, <laughs> um, but like I would say that Trump actually won non-college educated white women by an historic amount. I mean, he won them by 28 percentage points. You compare that with Mitt Romney; he won that demographic by 20 points. George W. Bush won that demographic by 17 points each time. I think John McCain won it by 14 points. I mean, so this is, he doubled John McCain's win almost. It was, it was a huge amount of, of, uh, of, of non-college educated women who, who turned out for him. And they were the, noticeably the only demographic um, in the campaign that swung. Um, so if you look at uh, like 
after at the end of the Democratic National Convention, during after the Kizir Khan stuff, non-college educated white women swung away from him, and then that's why he was losing over the summer. Then Kellyanne Conway comes on board. And, you know, I've known Kellyanne for I have a whole chapter on her in my book. I've known her for a long time. She she actually made made the argument for years that she's been frustrated by the Republican Party's it, like insistence on and not targeting women because they they think of it as like a special interest group and it's not what the Republican Party does. And she argues, well, if we make up fifty three percent of the electorate, we're actually the majority, so it's not really a special interest group. Um, and so. She got Trump to really focus on women over that summer, right? Like he went out to Detroit and campaigned in black churches to convince women that he wasn't racist. He trotted out Ivanka and a women's agenda. He barely managed to stay on message for a month or so. And and his numbers actually, <laughs> like, you know, improved. And he, by the time people forget, but by the time we get to the first de debate, they're tied in polls. And that's because non-college educated women have swung back to Trump more, right? And so then the groping things happened and he they swung hard away from him. Um, but then, you know, Comey happened. So on October 17th, the Atlantic PRI um, had a poll out where it showed Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump tied 40-40 amongst non-college educated white women, which means that if the election had been that day, there's no question that Hillary would have won that election, right? Because if she was tied with him, that would have been a, a huge historic swing of, of that demographic away from the Republican to the Democrat. Now, Comey gave women the excuse not to vote for her, and, and women voters are much more empathetic than male voters. And so they put themselves into the shoes of female candidates like Hillary Clinton and say, I wouldn't have made those life choices, therefore I'm not going to vote for her. They don't do that with male candidates. They don't look at Donald Trump and say, I wouldn't have groped these people, therefore I'm not going to vote for him. They definitely, and men never do that. They never put themselves in other male shoes. They never put themselves in women's shoes. They just vote for whoever they want to vote for. So because women are overly empathetic, those non college educated white women ended up voting like looking at Hillary saying I would not have made those choices in my email I do not think I'm above above everybody else and it just underlined to them how out of touch they felt she was with what they wanted you know and, and that she did not speak for them and so they swung hard really hard back to Donald Trump 28 points worth hard and so um, so I mean I don't know I mean he still has that support in many in many if you look at the polling his base is not like only men, that 35% of America that, that truly supports him, it's women too. So um, we have to keep that in mind. Um, so do you feel that it's enough for Democrats to simply be anti-Trump um, in some of these Midwestern and Rust Belt states um, that Democrats lost to Trump this last election? Or do you feel that um, the Dems need to kind of enact a more economically populist message that served Bernie really well in these states? Yeah, I think I touched on that, which is the, you know, I think there's a, you know, there is, I think two, you know, there are two frame, yeah, you know, I think there are two, um, two, two camps, right, that, you know, you, we need to be anti-Trump, we can't work with them, and there's a camp that says that, you know, we want to, we want to get things done, and I think if you look at voters, they, majority, overwhelming majority of voters would say, we want someone who can get, get things done, even within a, a Democratic primary. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I did a, I did a presentation at some point six months ago and I had, uh, we did a word cloud, uh, word cloud, basically name, uh, words associated with the two different parties. And I wanted to see what words were associated with Democrats, uh, uh, uh on Twitter. So when you use the word Democrat, what other words are, uh, typically, uh, used with the word Democrat and the the word that was the most prominent was Trump, which is um, not right now, you know, I mean, right now it's okay, it's fine. I mean, it's just kind of what you would think because Trump had, this was right when Trump had started, uh, you know, four or five months within his, his administration. But Democrats need to be defined outside of uh, Donald Trump and folks need to know what Democrats are gonna stand for and fight for. And um, in 2006, it was, you know, if you ask anyone at this table what was the democratic message in 2006 i i would give six for a six well but that was the issue issue i mean that was the policy that was the policy um campaign but the message a lot of it was anti was basically anti anti bush anti war well i think it was it was more anti bush and more it was also a critique of how he both got us into the iraq war and handled uh, katrina and sort of 
a bunch of the corruption that we saw in, in the House Republican conference. Now, so, you know, I think it's, a, I think Democrats do need to have, they, they need to have, um, you know, a pretty clear narrative about what they fight for and who they fight for and what they stand for. Um, but I do think that, you know, there's going to be a, a good deal of, um, of what they're going to probably generate momentum around will be the anti-Trump uh, strain of people that exist out there. That's driving a lot of energy. But if it, you know, the party needs to have a clear message about what they stand for. And right now, um, you know, that's still being debated and figured out. And, um, but I think it's important that we have that. In, in 20 seconds, I'd, I'd say that the easiest political adage I ever heard was politics is about addition rather than subtraction. And Democrats need to find a way to add people to their coalition and find a positive reason for people to vote for Democrats rather than say, I'm not going to vote for you. And I'm going to vote for Trump instead because of any number of fa uh, factors. So please ex explain this to me because um, Donald Trump, yes, he is president of the United States. He won the Electoral College. And yet... Hillary Clinton, the Democratic presidential nominee, won the popular vote by three million votes. So is it possible that Democrats can, uh, could overlearn from the mistakes made in the last campaign by forgetting the fact that even though their candidate didn't win, more American people voted for that candidate and presumably for the agenda that she had um, uh, than the folks who voted for Donald Trump. And I would love to hear what, what Rob and, and Ron have to say about, about this as well. Well, I mean, there's some, there's some structural stuff about the Electoral College that you know that, you know, it, it doesn't make sense other than to raise money to go to New York, Illinois, California for a Republican. We don't serve ads there. We don't, we don't spend any money there. We don't do anything there. So, um, and there's a whole lot of people there. Um, but those states are similar to Democratic candidates. I know as a movement, the Democrats are trying to look at Texas and some other states as maybe potentials to flip. But there's no, re there's no reason for Hillary to go to Texas. So there's some structural reasons. I mean, you know, I always feel like we're arguing um, a bad call by a referee after a football game when we get into this stuff. I mean, I don't know. I look at it as, as either you win or you lose based on the system and the rules that are in place. And... Um, so the, the popular vote argument, um, while interesting, I mean, I just kind of feel like I'm I, like, I'll, I'll, in, I'll answer my, your question with the kind of how you started, which is he won. And that's, um, that's kind of how to look at it. And to it's, so it, it's an unsatisfying answer. I understand that. I understand that, um, he got more electoral college votes, but that's the system we're in. And if, it's like the endless primary debate in Virginia, whether it should be a convention, a firehouse, or a firehouse primary, or a convention, or a, an open primary. Um, the person in charge sets the rules, and they set it so it, it, it is the way they want it to be, and um, it's just kind of how, I mean, I, I, it's like that's the way it is, is kind of the way I, I'd argue. Um, but also, um, so things aren't, as, your point is things aren't so bad, like don't scrap the whole thing because you, you, you still got a heck of a lot of people that showed up to vote for, okay, I'm sorry, I missed something. Yes, every political party, and I think Ron referenced it earlier, I mean, to use, since we're in Europe, uh, the, the Maginot line, but, you know, if political parties were responsible for visual representation of their strategy from one election to another, we would have marginal lines crisscrossing the yeah. U.S. endlessly because in 14, you know, the ghosts of the witch and the legitimate rape twins and all those guys, they followed, <laughs> when I, this was when I was running the, the Senatorial Committee, they followed me around the building everywhere and went. Every meeting somehow was, you guys need to, but this thing. And, and it was only after we won did those ghosts finally kind of, they never go away, but they kind of recede a little bit. And my whole point was, we, you know, things have changed, and like this is a different, and we, and, and um, so yes, I think you're you, remaking, or if someone wants to stand up in the party, be it Sanders or someone else, and say, "Follow me, I know where we're going." You always have to be very cautious that they're not overlearning the wrong lessons, and and um, um, I think a classic example was um, the 
RNC changed the rules twice. One was to prevent a Palin presidency, and the next was to um, 12, 12. They changed them for something make it, to make it easier for Mitt. To yeah, to make, it, to make it easier for Mitt to clear the field. We had 17 candidates. I mean, so the law of unintended consequences is very is much more important than the law of, of we need to make these bold changes. And and I think um, um, from our example. The autopsy was great in his discussion about diversity and inclusion and building the party, but the lessons it learned on how to control the party apparatus so we can have the favorable outcome DC thinks it should have was an absolute disaster. So yeah, I would agree with you on that. I mean, I think on a tactical uh, level, I think we we can learn a lot about what went wrong in 2016. How you know some decisions that were made in Michigan, in Ohio, in uh, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Um, you know, there were some strategic decisions there that we absolutely do, do have to take a look at. Um, I don't think there needs to be a whole revamp of the party. Um, you know, I think that we do need to we do need to tell a better story. Uh, we do need to tell we need to be better with our with the public in terms of what Democrats uh, stand for and fight for. Um, but I do think looking under the hood and tactically figuring out what um, we did wrong in, in three states that we absolutely should have won. Uh, and, uh, and others as well is, is really important. And I would also turn that question around and say that, you know, just because Republicans, you know, just because Trump won in 2016, they probably should not, and this goes back to a point I made earlier, it would probably be a mistake for them to not remember what was in that autopsy report in 2012 and not get too comfortable with their current status because we've seen many years, you know, 2004 Democrats were done and they are in the wilderness, right? We were never gonna come back. And then they said the same thing about Republicans in 2008. And so there's a cyclical thing. And I think it's really important that, uh, I think if the, that the Republicans not necessarily dismiss or ignore some structural issues that they have and some demographic challenges that they face. And from our standpoint, we have to do, we absolutely have an issue with blue collar voters and, and we have an issue with how we turn out our base and when that starts, which I've talked about before, in terms of turning it into a persuasion campaign and not just a motivation and not just a GOTV campaign. And, um, and so those are important things in how, in how we tactically run campaigns in states where, you know, quite frankly, we had no, we should have, we should not have, we should not have lost Michigan. We should not have lost Wisconsin. And Professor it, Christie, the last word. Oh, good. Then I'll get professorial for you. <laughs> you know, I, I think the Democrats shouldn't freak out by what happened as it relates to the popular vote and, and the Electoral College, although I would caution that most of the popular votes were racked up in California. So if I'm a Democrat, again, I'm still going to think of how do I get the addition, uh, additional votes rather than subtracting. But, you know, Jonathan, I look at, at Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders and others saying, you know, we should scrap the Electoral College and that, you know, it's, it's, it's not fair, it's antiquated. And you think to yourself, well, okay, fine, if you want to do that, are you going to put the United States back to where we were in 1800, where you have Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr both getting 72 votes and then going to the House of Representatives, and then ultimately the top voter vote getter becomes the president. In this case, it would be Hillary Clinton, and her vice president would be Donald Trump. I mean, I, I don't think that Democrats uh, would find that uh, a viable. Hell of a TV show, though. That would be what a hell of a TV show was right. So I, I think Democrats would be wise uh, to be careful what they're asking for um, and why we have the 20th Amendment that has the Electoral College and voting for electoral slates. Otherwise, we'd have a Hillary and Trump ticket, and good Lord, how much fun would that be? Yeah, but Democrats aren't really making a big push to go to the popular vote. I mean, I, well, I Hil mean, Hillary was. Well, Hillary's not the head of the party. I mean, yeah, Hillary mentioned. I mean, she alluded to it. I think your question was more: of Do we do you over do you overread examples in this in, in, in instance? You know, maybe in, same thing in two thousand where Demo we won the popular vote. Do we? And, but we lost the electoral vote. <laughs> Do we, you know, do we try to overlearn too many things when maybe things aren't that bad? Right. And I, and, and I think that's a, and I think that we got to learn from. We certainly have to take a strong look at our tactics because they obviously need to be, they need to be refined. Well, and you can talk about votes, and you know, came down to seventy thousand votes in Wisconsin or whatever it was, three districts. But how measuring the enthusiasm level and enthusiasm gap? in 2016 is the Democrats' real problem, just because Republicans had a candidate that their voters, Trump voters, were incredibly excited about. 
And Hillary Clinton, you just never saw the same pizzazz and the same, uh, you know, hardcore, unyielding support that you did with the Trump supporters. Well, on that note, um, <laughs> I'm gonna. We're running really late, so we are, should wrap it up. Um, and we've got a movie that we need to watch and a bar to attend. So. <laughs>